Well, I'm Mary Finch. I'm with the Philotus Main Society. I've been with them 13 years since they started. And I am um, here to do a training on um, bottle feeding kittens. Um, in that training, we're going to cover a couple of other things, uh, tube feeding and um, uh, sub-Q fluids. Because often when you have a crisis with a bottle feeding cat, you have to get involved in that. But first, a special request for Sherry, I'm going to share my coffee trick. If you have, particularly if you have a child or particularly a teenager whose job it is to dump the, scrape the cat box, they can get real reluctant to do that. And the reasons are it's inconvenient and it stinks. So I've come up with a solution even though I don't have a teenager anymore. I have three containers. One holds the scoop, one holds um, plastic bags, so I'm going to reuse those bags, and one's going to be the poop can. And I line the poop can with the plastic bag, so when it's full, and with four kittens it only takes 24 hours to fill it up, believe it or not, you just pull the bag out, tie it close, and put it in the trash. But the secret is, under this bag, we have coffee grounds. These are used coffee grounds that I've dried out, they're in the bottom, to keep the coffee particles from sticking to my plastic bag, basic science, electrostatic pressure, I put a barrier in. And I am using a, a coffee filter because it's really cheap, and I do a lot of gardening, and this is what you put in the bottom of your garden pots to keep the soil from washing out. But if you are into the Krueig things, you can put a paper plate, any, anything that will make a barrier. Then when you pull out this plastic bag, you are not pulling out coffee grounds. It doesn't smell as good as Starbucks coffee, but it smells a whole lot better than kitten poop. And so you don't have to fight your teenager to take care of it. This place to put it is right there. She doesn't have to go to the garage, go looking for something. Makes it much easier. That would be good for husbands, too. Yes. <laughs> Especially. They might, they're get, like they might get the duty. Yeah, they're like teenagers. Yeah. Uh, another thing with litter boxes, uh, CPS gives these out. These are grease scrapers, and they're free from CPS. They want you to scrape all your dishes so you're not putting grease down the drains. <laughs> if you scrape your litter box so that you have all the solids out, you spray it with this scrubbing bubbles. You wait 15 minutes and it will all rinse out. You will have a clean, um, disinfected, deodorized litter box. Mm -hmm. What makes it really easy to clean. Off, right? Now, if you wait 30 minutes, it's not gonna work. It will have dried up enough that you now have concrete to deal with, just like you did before. So those are important things to know about litter boxes. Put them over there into that part. Next slide. So this is Bottle Feeding 101 that we have done this year for you. Next slide. We're going to talk about some of the supplies that you need. Most of you will be familiar. Uh, some of uh, the most important supply for a kitten is warmth. We're going to talk about formula options, bottle and nipple options, and some of the things that we're doing to uh, improve our nipple situation. You have a chart on how to score the poop and if you have to go to the vet with a sick kitten, if you can give him the actual score on the poop, he's going to be much more impressed with your information. We're going to talk about feeding options, including sponge feeding, which is a real good trick to use with a kitten. Uh, the after feeding routine, which can get overlooked and mustn't be, it's really important. We're going to talk about the problems of ringworm, all this wonderful rain we're having today, we are going to definitely have ringworm popping up in a couple weeks. Yeah. Diarrhea, sub fluids, and you have some handouts. So the first thing, next slide please, the first supply you need is information. Now, I'm over 80 years old. I like paper, pencil, book kinds of things. Younger people go to the internet, and there are good resources on there. The kitten lady would be one of them. You just want to pay attention to what the source is, and if you're not sure about the information, try to get multiple inputs 
on the information. So if you're looking up, um, say, sponge feeding, don't just go with the first article. Read that one, read three or four more others to give you a broader picture of what the technique is. So that's uh, your uh, information. If you can't lay your hands on it, it's not information, it's just paper. So you want to keep yourself organized. I've got Megan doing this. We have lots of little things in here. And when we find something good, like there's a really good paper on the dilution of Clorox and water, with what strength you need for the various things you deal with, that kind of information is really important to have, but you need a pencil paper so you can get to it. Uh, next slide. The most important thing when you have a kitten, other than safety, and I, I don't have the safety slide in here, but before you take on kittens, you want to think about safety, the safety of yourself. I mean, I found a kitten up there on the elevated freeway where Bandera Road goes to 410. Somebody had thrown kittens out. Um, by the time we were able to stop, there was only one left alive. You have to think about the safety, the safety of your own animals when you're bringing these little guys into your house. Uh, the safety of the animals. So that's always in the back of your mind. But the next thing is warmth. When you get a little kitten in a situation like today with this heavy rain, they're going to be washed out of the gutters and the underground places that they are. And a cold kitten is a dead kitten. So you've got to get warmth to them really quick. And fastest way is down in the bra. If you have one, you just put it here and get it against your skin and take it to where you can get a better source of warmth. I learned by living in the desert that you always carry bottles of water, and because they make such an awful noise that I hate, I put them in a sock. When I am out and about and I discover kittens or someone brings me kittens, I can go into any Starbucks, show them this wet kitten, and say, can you give me some coffee? I need warm water in here, and they will do that. So that you immediately can have um, warmth for them. The other thing is in an emergency heating the uh, socks filled with rice up in your microwave and you lay your kitten in between them. More uh, warmth can come from a heating pad. You have to get the kind that doesn't turn off in 30 seconds or 30 minutes of inactivity. We have a cuddle safe down here. Um, just there's various ways to keep them warm. So those are all listed up there. Um, soft baby blankets are really good. Uh, I started out with towels and lots of people still donate towels to me, but towels really aren't real good with kittens because they catch their little toenails in them. So um, flannel is much better. And you need to learn how to do a burrito wrap where you wrap them up. The only thing showing is their little face. Because that's the only thing you're trying to get water or food or sugar into them, you wrap them up. And finally, sock sweaters. Next slide. These are sock sweaters made with little infant socks, and you, they're a struggle to get them on the kitten. But when you're in a situation where this is where you, you, your source for your warmth, it's worth doing. So have your friends give you their little kids' leftover socks because you never know what size you need. And the bigger they are, the easier are they are to get on them, of course, the easier they are for the kitten to wiggle out. But you cut holes for the arms. These are closed at the end, and those are wonderful if you have kittens that suck on the private other litter mix. And th that behavior is a natural behavior compounded by the fact that they're not getting a lot of sucking since they're being bottle fed. They're not getting the hours of sucking they would get on the mother. And it can be very dangerous for a kitten. So you don't need to cut the, close this off. However, if you cut that open, it's much more easy. It's easier to take care of their elimination. So if you're using what I call a closed toe sock, <laughs> you're going to have to constantly be putting clean ones on there. And it's not easy to do. This picture was taken down during Hurricane Ike when we were taking, intaking uh, kittens. We didn't have electricity. We were down at Stinson. It was the middle of the night and somebody said, sock sweaters. And she ran to home and got socks and came back and we were able to save all those kittens because we could get them warm. Next slide. 
your formula options. Um, you, those of you that are here, um, I really recommend this brand of formula. Um, I have used KMR. Uh, those are the only two I will use. Uh, this one costs just a little bit less. This is about $75 once it is shipped to you. Um, but the, the, this formula, they do not get diarrhea as badly as they do with KMR. And it really makes a significant difference. So that is uh, right here. Just born is what we use for newborn kittens that did not get cholesterol from their mother. So that you can buy in powdered form if you do a lot of um, bottle feeding. You just want to keep that in the freezer as a powder. KMR works good. I wouldn't recommend you get the liquid, get the powder, because then you, you aren't wasting as much. And goat's milk, this is from HEB, powdered goat's milk. That is your go-to formula when you have nothing else. You can use it with any mammal until you can get to a better choice. It is not going to upset them like people who use one lady was using coffee creamer, uh, cat milk, got whiskers cat milk. Both of those will make little kittens really ill. So um, I keep goat's milk in, a, in powder form in my freezer all the time. And neighbors know that I do bottle feeding. And they bring me bunny rabbits and all kinds of things. So it's good to have. Next. You make your formula daily. It seems when you have a bunch of kittens more convenient to make up a quart at a time. No, it needs to be made daily, be kept fresh as possible. And I do use bottled water. My husband insists that we give the cats bottled water. They then go drink out of the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> but we do make the kitten formula with bottled water. Make it up fresh each day. Next slide. Uh, you have a copy of this chart. What it does is it tells you based on the weight of your kitten and the age, how much you're going to feed it to meet the calories that it requires. And you have to know how much of your uh, formula is needed to provide that minimum number of calories. So it's a matter of math. But if you have a 300 gram kitten and it's between two and three weeks old, and it's going to need 60 calories per um, 100 grams, so three times 60. And then it tells you what volume of your milk you need to get to meet that requirement. Then you look at the stomach capacity, and you divide the stomach capacity into the larger number, and it tells you how many times to feed them. It is a lot of milk. After a little experience, you know, just by looking at the kitten. But when you are starting out, if you're concerned, if you're giving them enough food, this is a great way to do it. There are simpler charts, but they all tell you basically the same thing. Next slide. Nipples. Bottle feeding, it all comes down to nipples. This is a miracle nipple. This happens to be an old one. It's very soft. Um, the newer ones are much whiter and they're much stiffer. The advantage to having stiffer ones is that the kittens can't bite the tip off and swallow it. But the disadvantage is they're not comfortable in a little kitten's mouth. You can get um, the shorter size, the mini, for newborn kittens. And then at about two and a half to three weeks, you're going to have to move up to this one. They're not going to like the transition, but they get hungry enough, they eat. The other kind of nipple that we constantly come across is um, pet ag, and it's okay, but these will work better. And um, PetSmart is now marketing a set of bottles where the increments are in raised plastic, because these wash off right away. Um, forgot my thought. Another thing you feed would what be size your... size bottle do you get the Miracle Nipples on? Pardon me? The, the Miracle Nipples. When I had them the couple times I've ordered them, they came with like a syringe. Yes. So you snap lock on them or something. Yes. How do you, how do you, what size of bottle can you put those on? 
Uh, they will go on any bottle, but what you're looking for is because the base of them is thicker, right. notice that this ring is taller than this ring. Okay. The Pet Ag bottles have the wider ring, that's not what you would call it, but the cap, which will keep the nipple on there. You can keep it on this one, but if you have a real aggressive kitten, they can pull it off and just have milk go everywhere. Oh. So it's not just the nipple, right. you need the the right cap to hold that bottle. I had trouble getting an ear from nipple into the cap thing. Yes, I finally found that a that little spoon me. that I can push them down from the top and it works. Ah, but it okay. is, it's, it's hard. Okay. And it's the kind of thing that if you're feeding the kitten, you can't just make a change. So I usually, when I sit down to feed, I have a couple of extra tops with nipples there available. Okay. So if, if um, persnickety. The six, the six thing on the, the, the little thing you lock it onto, the little syringe thing. Mm -hmm. That's, you have to have three or four of those. Yes. So yeah. it's almost easier if I can finally get one to lock on. I don't want to take that out and have to switch it all the time. No. And that's when they can't figure out how to grab it. And, and it's best, yeah. you know, in terms of good practices, that each kitten have its own nipple and right. bottle. Right. And I color code them, so if it's going to have a purple mark here and a purple mark here and it, the kitten's got a purple piece of um, embroidery floss around the neck. But when you get one nipple that's really working, it's really tempted to take it out of A and stick it in B because it's going to take that nipple. But yeah, they're really persnickety. And one of the things I do, you know, when the kitten put it, puts its paws up, all right, but it's not coordinated enough that it really can hold on to. These are scrunchies from the girls' hair department. And you just put them on there, and yeah, they get dirty right away, and you have to wash them, but the kitten can hold on to these. It's very uh, soothing to the kitten. It's like being up to mama. So the scrunchies really work. And then that brings us to the next thing. These are infant socks for brand new babies. So they're very stretchy. Well, you can make an e-collar out of two of those. You stuff them with cotton balls, and you sew the open end of this one over the toe of the next one, and then you just pin it closed, and you can make an e-collar. Well, why would you need an e-collar on a little kitten? You might if you're giving it medication that you don't want it to lick up. When we talk about some of the meds that we're using with ringworm, we don't want them to be able to get back to their backside, particularly if you're treating with um, an irritated rectum and you're using like um, anything with a petroleum base, like Vaseline, that's lethal to kids. So you want to be real careful about that. That's why we use those. Okay, so it's feeding time. So next slide. You get yourself organized. It's Murphy's Law. Telephone's going to ring. Someone's going to come to the door. So you get everything you need. And it looks really messy. And I sit down on the floor and I spread out. I've got my kittens all over. <coughs> Two telephones, landline, mobile phone, <coughs> the written record. I keep very detailed records of how much my kittens eat and poop and all that. Toilet paper. I'm going to warm the formula in this cup. I've got the litter box. I've got trash. And everything I need, if it's evening, I've got a glass of wine. If it's the morning, it's a cup of coffee. But I am in my zone. And my neighbors know, if they know I'm home, and I don't come to the door, they know it's feeding time. I get organized. Next slide. That's the position you want the kitten in. It's very natural. And so if it's working real well, that's what it should look like. I do want to point out, this little kitten is digging its hind feet into whatever the surface is there. So if it's outside, it's digging into the dirt. And that's one of the sources of the ringworm that we deal with. So we'll come back to that. But that's a um, little kitten named Hummus, all ready to eat. Next slide. So bottle feeding, when it goes perfectly, that's what it looks like. It just doesn't go perfectly all the time. So, next slide. One of the options that we have, and we've stolen this one from the dog world, is to take a cosmetic sponge 
And I do caution you to look at the label and make sure it's not made in China. I'm not trying to be political. It's just that their standard for cleanliness is different than from ours. So you get your sponge and then you trim the end of it to what you think the nipple should be like for the baby. And puppies, it's really easy to get these in the mouth because even little puppies have kind of a snout that you're working with. Little kittens, a little harder to get their mouth open to get these in. You soak this in your formula till it's saturated. You get it into the mouth and then the trick is you're going to feed more formula into this sponge from the side. So if it's going in right there, I've got this right up close to the business end of the sponge, <coughs> and it's going to feed right in, and if the kitten is able to suckle, now this kitten has to be strong enough to suckle, but it may be a cleft palate kitten and may have a mouth injury where the regular nipple is not gonna work for you. So this would be um, advantageous to be able to do. It's a one-time use. You can't use this over again, so you have to buy a bunch of them. They're not really very expensive. With puppies, it works really well. Um, a lot of puppies have to be fed that way. So sponge feeding is an option that we have. Next, next slide, tube feeding. Tube feeding is life-saving for the kitten. However, it is very invasive. So I try not to do it unless it's absolutely necessary. And I try to do it just a few times. A fed kitten is going to be a kitten that is not able to suckle. It may be so uh, far gone that you, know, you just have to do this. In order to tube, see, tube feed, um, I have brought two kittens. And these aren't the best because these are bigger and they're not going to be real happy to be too fit. But we will get ready. You need um, your catheter and um, you have to order these online. I've given you a resource, but be aware that right now medical supplies are being commandeered for people needs. So a lot of these places will tell you that they're out of stock. So you need to watch, and when they come in stock, you need to get one. And, and just put it away for the day, the day that you need it. They come in sizes three, five, and eight. Three would be a very newborn kitten. Five is more than likely what you're gonna need. Then you have to figure out, how am I gonna place this in the kitten? And you measure from the tip to You're gonna make a mark. Now this one has little numbers on it. Megan loves this one. I can't see those little tiny numbers. So I take a marker and I make a mark. And since I might use it a couple of months later with a different kitten, I get lots of colors and marks on here. You can get the, this to come off with alcohol so that you don't get confused. And then we need a kitten. We're gonna get smudge. This is a little smudge. She has a smudge on her nose and she is about seven weeks old. Um, she is the most difficult kitten I've ever saved. She went three weeks where she would not eat and she has been too fed a lot. And I need to make a mark on here since she hasn't been too fed for a while. To, so I know how far to insert this tube. And you start with the point where the ribs come together, your solar plexus. It's on yourself here, but from your body, your ribs go down. It does on the kitten too. So we don't measure from that joint. We measure from the furthest rib. So I feel till I find where that last rib is. It's right there. Put that there and I measure up to the edge of her mouth. And then I am gonna give myself a pinch more room because I'm gonna be pinching 
that tube right at that point. And if I don't allow a little bit more room for that mark to show, I'm going to be covering it up with my fingers. So we're going to get some water. You would dip this in formula, and then we need to fill it. Okay. You want to be sure that you have a syringe that is long enough to go in here. And if you're going to, um, if you need a new syringe, I just take this to my friendly uh, Walgreens pharmacist and say, I need a thing to go in there because I'm going to two feed a kitten and he will know which syringe and you know he will bring them out and he doesn't charge me anymore. So I'm going to fill my syringe with water. She said, I don't think I'm going to like this. And when I'm tube feeding, um, I'm keeping real exact measurements. It's better to use less and do it more often than to give her too much. And then I put, let's say I'm going to be feeding um, four milliliters. I'm going to have a little extra in there because I've got to empty the tube of air. Then I would dip this in, in the formula, and get her to swallow it, which she's not going to be want to do. And I'm at my mark, because I have her mark on here. And this would be an important time to have hubby help you. Well, this is the time where you need your number and where you live. <laughs> yeah, and, and I'm not going to stress her out anymore, but yeah. you get the idea. So how do you know, I guess, that does it go down in her lungs? OK, that's a good question. If it were going in her lungs, you would meet resistance two inches before you get to your mark. So as you're pushing it down, if you get resistance, you just pull it out. And it's very common to have that resistance. Don't feel bad that you're doing it wrong. You just have to pull it out. It takes me about three times to get it in there. Now, this little girl had to be fed for three weeks, tube feeding. She would not eat. I don't like that. So you, you, you make your mark, you make your measurements, give yourself room to pinch so that you can see where your mark is, and then gently insert it. Um, be sure and put a little formula on it. And little kittens are really good about just swallowing, and, and it will go down easily on them. I'm going back in my pen. So that's tube feeding. Do you have any questions on that? If Megan were here, she would have all both kittens up here. And I'm not going to do that. Um, so tube feeding is something we do if we have to. Be sure to warm the milk. Then cleaning the tube. You're going to take it um, to your sink, and you're going to pull hot water into it and, and, and plunge it back and forth several times. But I talk with a friend of mine who's a nurse, and she says at least once every 24 hours, when you are two feeding with the same tube over and over, use a mixture of 50% alcohol and 50% water, and really clean it well. Then you have to rinse it, plunge a lot of water through it to get all the alcohol out. But she said you, every 24 hours you need to clean them with alcohol. All right. The torture session is over. Next slide. It's showing you how to measure, and yes, I know it's a puppy, but I couldn't find a kitten picture on the internet. So we're going for the rib, where that lowest point of the rib cage is, to the corner of the mouth. That's your link. Add one more pinch, make your mark with your Sharpie, and use that. A lot of people make the mark sitting with the Sharpie with a piece of tape. So it's not on there permanently. We woke her up, we're going to be sorry. And you in, gently insert 
And here we're getting to the mark. You have less than two inches, so you definitely are not in the lungs. If the kitten is crying, great. That means it's not in the lungs as well. Okay, next slide. Syringe feeding. This is one step up above um, tube feeding. So when you have a kitten and it's been tube fed, you're going to be trying every day to replace the tube with the syringe. And you want one with a long neck. Again, you go to the pharmacist and say, this is what I need. You can buy them, but they sell them in quantities of 50. You don't need 50. It's better to go pay cash for them at the drugstore. And <clears throat> you're going to bring it into the side of the kitten's mouth. You don't squirt straight down the throat. You just squirt across the mouth. And yes, you waste a lot of milk that way, but you don't get too much milk down their throat, which is really hard for them, bad for them. So you do that. When they get a little more advanced, you put the nipple on, whether it's the mini or the regular nipple. And when they are getting the idea, they are literally going to be feeding themselves. You don't have to put pressure on it. This tube will come down. And you can do solid food when you're, you might have a kitten that needs Gerber's baby food. It will go through here. So when the kitten can suck down the milk, you don't need the syringe anymore. You just put that nipple on the bottle and you're back in business. So it's a stage, um, it's step by step to get them you can't just uh, um, start with bottles with some kittens. After you fed the kitten, and I feed in an organized way, because I, I didn't bring them today, but I have all these little records. You have a copy of the record sheet. And let's say I have four kittens, and I'm going to call them A, B, C, and D. First feeding of the day, A is first, B, C, D. Next feeding, I start with B, C, D, A. Next feeding, I start with C, D, A, B. That way, two things. The kitten, the same kitten is not always having to wait. That is stressful for the kitten. Once they really get hungry and everything, that kitten is going berserk. So you, you alternate in an organized way. At the end of the feeding of the four kittens, Whichever kitten is the last kitten, and it would be kitten D on the first fe feeding of the day, I thoroughly examine that kitten. And I call that the baby wipe rub down. I look at that kitten, all the external things. I'm checking for fleas. I'm checking for irritation on the, on the privates. Um, um, I'm looking for the development of ringworm, any uh, skin things that just don't look right so that each kitten is getting a good evaluation every day. And we want to talk about ringworm, and we're back to that slide where he's digging his little feet in. And you deal with feral kittens. These are kittens that um, are outside in the dirt when they are eating. And they, the kittens dig in their little feet um, when you're feeding them to, to get um, so that they can get up to the mother tightly. And in that dirt is where you're going to find ringworm. So could we go to the next slide? Ringworm is not a worm. A worm. It's a fungi. If you have a garden with uh, mulch in it, and you see mushrooms growing in your mulch, you've got, you've got ringworm. It's, it's named. So, one of the first things you want to keep in mind, it's out there, you want to keep it out there. Don't wear your gardening shoes into your house. That's bringing the spores in your house, and the spores are hard to get rid of. Uh, anytime you bring in new kittens, be sure to put them in a room where all the surfaces are washable. They don't need fabric, they don't, need a, don't want a rug under them, and you want to keep them in quarantine for two weeks. That is to protect any other animals that you have in your house and yourself. So, and, and that even means all the neighbors who want to see the new kitties that come knocking on the door, particularly the ones that are children, they can't come until the kittens have been there two weeks. Then you do your thorough daily exam on your kitten as you're feeding it, 
and there's a place to put comments. That's where I put my notes down. If something ain't right, we call that SAR, S-A-R, something ain't, ain't right. If you feel something's not right with that kitten, notate it. Don't worry that someone else would disagree. Keep those notes because should that kitten get sick later on, being able to go back and say, oh yeah, on Tuesday I noticed is going to be really helpful in finding the right answer for that kitten. Hand washing. 2020-2021 has taught us the importance of hand washing. So you're going to be washing your hands, but you're also going to be washing the paws of the kittens in a minute. You're going to wear a kitten smock. This is not because it's fashionable. In our organization, we've made a bunch of these, and you have a smock for each set of kittens. So if Megan has two sets, she's going to take her smock off for set one and put a new smock on for set two so she's not cross-contaminating. Now, it doesn't have to be fancy. It can be an old T-shirt. But I always wear the same... Um, covering when I'm working with my litter of kittens and very quickly they learn the smell of that and if I sit down and I have that on they know they're going to be fed or at least they feel like they should be fed. Um, thymol wipes. Thymol is thyme oil and it's parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. It is the herb. These are seventh generation wipes you can buy them in HEB, and they have thyme oil in them. And it is a natural antifungal material. So whenever I have new kittens, everybody gets a wipe down every day in that baby wipe rub down. If I have a kitten that I suspect is exposed to or maybe developing, they get a real thorough scrubbing with this. And it is not an objectionable smell. It smells like a herb, you know. It's really good. Uh, it's also, if I am outside and I have a whole lot of mushrooms growing and stuff, I'm going to use this on my shoes before I come in the house or my bare feet. Uh, the other thing that I use, and we're still talking about keeping yourself safe, is this is an anti-dandruff shampoo. It's called Nixoral. It's on your list of resources. It comes in a box. So if you're in HEV in the dandruff aisle and you're looking for this little blue bottle, you're not going to find it. It's in a little white box. It's ketoconazole. That is the most effective thing that you can use against ringworm. And this is 1%, so you don't need to have a prescription. When I'm working with kittens, and Smudgy here is recovering from a face full of ringworm, this was my body wash while I was taking care of that kitten. Um, everybody is exposed to ringworm. It's only the vulnerable, little children, young kittens, and ladies my age. Mm -hmm. So I have to take... Um, I have to take care of myself or I can't be the caregiver to kittens. So this is what I'm going to use. This is about an $8 bottle and it's in HEB, not even HEB plus, just a regular HEB in the dandruff section. So I always use this. Uh, I can tell you it burns your eyes. So if you are, the, the next thing I'm going to do is bathe the kittens with this. I'm going to have to be real careful around their face because it does irritate the eye a little bit. So that's one person as a body wash. And then I dis disinfect the cat room daily. And my husband will tell you I run the vacuum cleaners because I can't stand walking on cat litter. I'm from Hawaii. I don't like walking on sand. I don't like walking on cat litter. So I have my vacuum cleaner out and I have my, um, I scrub a lot. And cleaning is one of the most time consuming parts of cat, and care, cat care, but you've got to do it, particularly between litters. Uh, I use um, a one to eight concentration of Clorox. So one ounce of Clorox and eight ounces of water, that's very strong. Uh, and I, you put it on your floor, your surfaces, and you have to let it stay wet for 10 minutes. It won't do the job if it 
dries up sooner than that. So you slosh it around, and then I go back in there with towels and dry it up. And of course, the towels lose their color. Also, in the laundry, when I'm washing uh, cat linen, I use a laundry sanitizer, which was very hard to get, get during uh, the beginning of COVID, but Lysol and Clorox both make good um, laundry sanitizers. And you just put it in like a um, uh, softener. Works real well. Okay, that's prevention. Preventing me from getting it, preventing the rest of the cat household from getting uh, ringworm. When you're treating ringworm, whatever you do is going to be worthless if you don't get the crust off. The ringworm is down in the pores of the skin. So you have to get that crustiness off there. And that is very uncomfortable for the kitten. I use a soft toothbrush and warm water and scrub. And they are howling their little heads off. But you've got to get that off because if you don't, whatever medication you're putting on there is not getting to the source of the problem. So remove the crust, wipe the kitten down. You might have to do it every three or four times a day. But this will keep it from spreading to other parts of the body. Bathe the kitten in your body wash and be careful around its eyes. Every day? Yes, I would bathe it daily. And this is a, a pet medication, so you can get this, um, you don't need a prescription, you can get it online, it's on your list of, uh, of supplies, and it is pet safe in the sense that you do not have to um, put the e-collar on the kitten. And you can put this right on the sites. It is not as effective as ketoconazole 2%. So it might take you four or five days before this really has an effect. Where if you can get a hold of 2% ketoconazole, and we found that it's in your uh, supply list, we found some uh, reasonably priced 2% that you can get that is pet safe. So that reference is in there. I have been using free samples given to me by my dermatologist who does not approve of me playing around with uh, kittens with ringworm. Mm -hmm. Another pet safe product, these are ketoconazole and chlorhexidine wipes. They're like tucks and especially if you have a kitten like Smudge who has the ringworm on the face, these are safe to use around the face and you just take the toothbrush and scrub off the scabby stuff and then go after it with this. And then you feed them does so that they forgive you. Does it sting? So that they have no, it does not sting them. No. Good question. If you don't have these things, you can't get to them. Uh, monostat that we use for vaginal infections works, but this has um, the white cream, which is um, Butyl alcohol, that you don't want the kittens eating, it. licking it off, either this kitten or the other. So you isolate the kitten and you put on the e-collar. So that's where you would need it for this. This is the gel that I get from my dermatologist and I've given you a reference where you can get a pet safe one. New stock, very effective, it is a uh, suspension of sulfur so it goes on like a yellow toothpaste uh, unfortunately it comes in pretty big because it is for horses and cattle it comes in pretty big tubes it's the kind of thing in our organization that they have one at the office and you take a little bottle with a tight fitting cap and you go over and squirt some in you do not need a lifetime supply of this material to treat one little kitten However, it is very effective. It really is. Um, so those are treatments. Any questions about ringworm? I have to tell you, I've Nightmares, never but no questions. <laughs> no, it's... Um, I never dealt with it. I never got it. It's... I, 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 this 
weather that we're having now, the ringworm's going to go through the sky high. But a lot of kittens aren't going to make it through this weather, so it's going to balance it out. But ringworm is just a fact of being a kitten foster. Next. These, we're going to get into the problem areas, and of course the first thing you deal with is poop. And when a, I, I live in a senior center. Um, uh, we have a dining room, and we go in in the evening for our meals, and you can sit with whoever wants. And one of the ladies I was sitting with, she says, I don't like sitting with you, because you always talk about poop. Now, I like hearing about the kittens, but you're always talking about the poop. And I said, well, that's because the poop is the most important thing about the kittens. You've got to know the poop situation and know what their health is. So I, I try not to mention that in front of her, but we all have to deal with the poop. And any time you change a kitten's diet, whether you have a good reason or you have a poor one, but whenever you change the diet, you are going to have a digestive upset. If it's just an upset due to change in diet, it's going to clear itself up in the next 24 hours. So you're going to do some extra cleaning, but it'll be okay. If it's something like Giardia or one of the bacterial infections, it's going to take a lot longer, and you're going to have to talk to your mentor or talk to uh, uh, Sherry and see what if this is the situation where you need to get the kitten to a bed. So this is poop, and you have a page of the official poop scoring system. And when I am keeping records, and I'm going to go off screen here, when I am keeping records of my kittens, there is a column here that says potty, and I can put the poop score right there. It saves me a lot of writing. And if I see, okay, I'm doing four, four, three, two, one, I've got a problem. So that is just helpful, especially if you're doing quite a few kittens. Next slide. And that's your system. And what you want, I mean, here we have what I call rock stage. And this is more raisin stage. And this is more um, Tootsie Roll stage. This is what we want right here. Okay. And then we're getting into the snake stage. But it is formed. Or you get into the pudding stage or you can get all the way to mustard. Now those words mean something to all of you who've done kittens, but it's better off if you can just use the number. The number seven is your mustard stage, and you must get to the bed if you're dealing with that one. Next, next slide. Constipation. You wouldn't think it'd be a problem, but a lot of times the kittens that come to us are constipated because they are dehydrated. So you, tr you treat for the dehydration. We just lost two of Smudgy's litter mates that we know that they went days and days without feeding and they got very um, constipated and one died right away. The other one we didn't get an enema in there quite soon enough and the colon began to break down and you can't save the kitten from that. So you have to watch. If you have a kitten who is not regular where you're uh, and you see that it's straining to get the poop out but it can't get it out that's a situation where you need to be thinking about okay am i going to give it some oil and don't use mineral oil because mineral oil um, they can't break that down to eat so it in, it lines the uh, intestines and it doesn't let the nutrition through it's better to use olive oil because they can they can break that down and get nutrition. So when you have a little kitten that's really constipated, they will let you know. And we have exercises. And you just hold them up and down. They don't particularly like this. Then you're playing with them and you're rubbing their little tummy and constantly massaging. Even a warm bath or a butt bath helps. And so it isn't like, okay, I've got to treat the kitten for constipation. You, it's just be aware of all these things that you can do anytime you're handling the kitten that will help. The exercise, the moving of the abdomen up and down, keeping the tummy a little warm, um, adding a, uh, just a couple of drops of olive oil to their 
food. All those things help. But this, this is Megan's kitten push-up. She's really into this. <laughs> Next slide. Dehydration. And that was the best picture I could find on the internet. When you have dehydration and you pinch and you pull that um, skin up, you don't want to do it right at the neck. You want to come past the neck here. Right at the neck, the skin is really tight anyway. So you come back about an inch and you pull it up gently. And if it stays up, and it's hard to tell, but in this picture, that's supposed to show that it's staying up. Then you have a kitten who is uh, showing signs of dehydration. Next slide. When, when I'm going to give sub-Q fluids, I have to create an entry point. And I'm going to hold the kitten my hand over the head, and I'm going to pinch this area, and I'm trying to make a tent. So here's the top of the tent. This is the doorway into the tent. And I'm going to be running the needle in that area. And because my fingers are right there, I'm going to be really careful because these <laughs> needles are really sharp. So we are going to demo that. I have Ringer's lactate. And I'm going to take an alcohol pad. There is an entry point for the lactate right here, this little button. And I go over that with my alcohol pad. And if the cat kitten is cold or this is not room temperature, I need to warm it, I would put it in a bowl of warm water so the temperature is, is adjusted to what I want. If you have a really cold kitten, this is a good way to warm it up. I am going to figure out how much I'm going to give a kitten. I usually try to give one ml for each ounce of the kitten, but I don't like to give more than, say, seven. I would rather give it two groups of four than to give it eight because it just, if the skin gets too tight, it's too uncomfortable. So, I'm going to figure out how much I'm going to give that kitten, and I'm going to I'm going to put that much air in the bag. So let's say I'm going to give seven. And if you're using these um, syringes, and you will find that after they've been used a couple times, they become hard to press in. Just where's the one that is sterile? Okay, one I can pull apart. I'm going to oil this. So I pull this out, and I'm going to put some olive oil, again because they can just uh, digest it if it gets in their food. I'm going to put just a little bit of olive oil on there, and I mean just a little bit. I'll take a Q-tip and just barely get some on there and run it back and forth, and you can get a nice smooth motion in here. Otherwise, you have to throw the syringe away and get a new one. It's it kind of expensive if you're doing this a lot. So, I'm going to make sure that my syringe here is moving. I'm going to set it for seven. I sterilize that. Be sure that you don't poke a hole through the bag on the other side, so you have to be careful. And I'm going to insert that much air in the bag. I'll make it much easier for me to withdraw what I want. And recap your needle just for safety because they're very sh sharp. And I would create a little tinted area. And then I would insert the needle between my fingers. So this is sterile water. And we have a victim here. <laughs> this is King Tut. 
you don't need to do this for me. I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I'm going to feel around. And I want to get a slope going up so that I have an entry point. So That's the hard part for me. It always comes out, the needle always comes out the other side. Yeah, <laughs> it's tricky. Now I'm pulling it up, and one thing that helps is if you are moving the kitten along a surface as you're doing this, it doesn't struggle nearly as much. All right, Mr. Tut, let me have some skin. Their skin is surprisingly thick. Now I'm just gonna give him a couple of cc's because he really has no problem. You were a good boy. So he has a little lump there, and it will take about 15 minutes for that to go away. If I have a kitten in real distress, and I'm doing sub-Q fluids, I might be doing them every 15 minutes for maybe two or three hours, till I can see whether it's having a positive effect or not. If, it's, if I've done that much and it's not having a positive effect, I'm going to, I'm going to stop, try something different, or Sometimes you just have to let the kitten go. You're all right, baby boy. Thank you. Now they'll tell their war stories. <laughs> so that's giving um, the sub-Q fluids and, and you bring up a good point. It's very nerve wracking and I have stuck my fingers many times. Uh, again, we're going to clean this with alcohol when we're all done and then take it apart so that it dries out completely. And I use a new needle each time so that you have the needles come in sterile packets. Any questions about sub-Q fluids? You can use them to warm the kitten as, to, as well as treat dehydration. When you're treating dehydration, it's also good to treat for hypoglycemia because it's probably present and it won't hurt them if it's not present. You take a Q-tip and you put it in your sugar syrup. Um, you can use maple syrup. You can use uh, carol. Tick, carol. Yeah, carol syrup, but that's very thick. Uh, so I sometimes thin that with water. But I feed hummingbirds, that's four to one, that's exactly what you need. So I use my hummingbird feeding stuff. Uh, had a friend who wasn't having much success. She was using maple syrup, she was using the sugar-free. <laughs> sugar I've done that. <laughs> so we, we had a little learning lesson there, all right? And again, you go in sideways, you stroke the tongue, and you do it every 15 minutes, and it's either gonna make a difference, or you're gonna go ahead and probably lose the kitten. When kittens crash, they crash very quickly. And when you see them begin to stretch out their body, stretch their spine backwards, then they are very close to death at that point. And what about honey? I, I don't recommend honey for two reasons. One, they say not to use it even with babies. Uh -huh. And I don't know what the chemistry is involved there. But the other thing is that it's really thick and I'm not, I'm not sure that it's not going to choke them. It's a good question, though. Next slide. Fading kitten syndrome. Uh, this is Megan's uh, burrito wrap, and she will wrap the kitten up so just the face is there so that you could administer fluid. You could, um, you could put sugar uh, water in this little kitten. But we really don't know what fading kitten syndrome is. Um, we're dealing with symptoms. We don't know the causes. Um, it happens very quickly. Sometimes uh, a kitten is gone in 30, 30 minutes. You wouldn't have had time to get it to the vet. Sometimes you have clues when you look back in your records that you saw something that wasn't quite right on Tuesday and Thursday you have a serious problem. Uh, we're not going to save all the kittens. And it's really important that you do your best, but you keep the kitten warm, you keep the kitten as comfortable as you can, you give the kitten love, because it may have been the only time in its life that it experienced that. Next slide. That's my record. 
And um, I find, find it very useful. Uh, it, it, when a kitten comes in, I weigh them. I use the scales. And if you're not using the scales when you're fostering, I won't let you foster for me. I mm -hmm. want to know how much you weighed before I fed it. I want to know how much you weighed after I fed it, because that's the only thing that's really telling me for sure how much it got. Because I know how much I sprayed all over the bathroom, but mm -hmm. how much did it actually swallow? So I really depend on the scales. And when I train uh, people for Hello to Humane Society, I say, you know, you got to have scales. If you haven't got that, you don't get a kit. Next slide. Just a review. You got to keep them warm. You need to keep them clean, as clean as you can. You're going to do a lot of clean. Um, I would say uh, an hour per kitten per day is going to be clean. Um, they are tough little guys. Uh, in Smudge's litter, I would go in every morning thinking she would be gone, and she just kept on coming like Energizer Bunny. So you just keep trying. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. My major reluctance in taking the bottle babies is that I don't have any help, and um, I work. And when I have done it, it's just been, you know, I've just been ready to drop. I don't get any sleep. Yes, it's exhausting and it's very stressful, even when it's going well. Mm -hmm. And when it's not going well, it's extremely stressful. And I would say you're probably not doing, you shouldn't be doing mm -hmm. bottle babies. You might want to get the grueling babies. Mm -hmm. That's um, what I usually have done. But I want to do the bottom <laughs> Sometimes you can find a partner who can switch off with you. Um, I've done that with Susan a few times where I'll take them for a couple days, then she'll take them for a couple days, and that way you get a chance to sleep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have a friend that, um, when she's working, she doesn't often have kittens, but when she's working and she has kittens, she drops them on my doorstep on her way to work and picks them up in the evening. And so I just have kittens during the daytime. So mm -hmm. it works well for both of us. Mm -hmm. So a partner is, is mm -hmm. a, a good thing. <laughs> Otherwise, um, you can do respite work. Let your organization know that you're available for someone who's going to be out of town for two or three days. They will just worship at your doorstep because mm -hmm. their travel plans are really up in the air if they can't find someone to, to watch their animals. <laughs> I'm going to watch a puppy this weekend because people, I don't do dogs, but their son is getting married and they haven't been able to find anybody else to, to watch this little miniature dachshund kind of thing. So <laughs> we've been practicing. My cat thinks it's the ugliest kitten she's ever seen, but we're taking care of their little dog. So you, you should have to partner up. So let's say you have a litter and they all look pretty much alike. So you put some. You put something. I take. I take. Um, I, I, I'm. I'm cheap. You can buy nice little collars that you can reuse. I take my embroidery floss and I make a collar that is big enough to go around that they, but they can't get their foot in it because they will do that. And I just have a different color for each kitten. I remember something you telling us about nail polish. Oh, I know what you mean. Black kittens. Black kittens. How do you tell apart black kittens? I get out my colored markers. My Sharpie's not black. <laughs> and I go down in the ear. Come here. Oh, what a great idea. <laughs> I use that for traffic. Not now marker. polish. Uh, when I get black cats, I don't know one from the other. Uh, yeah. And if I go in and I'm taking them to the Humane Society and I don't want my black cat to get mixed up with somebody else's black cat, I buy that um, that craft paint that's acrylic like you got it at Walmart mm -hmm. for like 50 cents a little bottle. And I have a chopstick and I stick it in there and I stick it to the top of the cage and I color their head with my well, color is apple green, so I put it on there. And so when I go in, if I see the green paint on the cat, now I put it on every cat I take in. Tabbies can look a lot alike, and, and there's certain colors, they just look so much alike. Such a <laughs> anyway, I, um, well. I so if you come up here, you we'll can edit see. it. <laughs>
But I, this lady came flying in the room and said, this is not my black cat. And it took them forever to figure out what they'd done. If you come up here, you can see, see this is ear. gray kitten, but the ear would be the same. Even in a black yeah. kitten, you have a light colored ear. So you assign a color to that there kitten, <laughs> and you make that mark. Now, that's greasy. Every day, you're going to have to remake that <coughs> mark. But first thing you know, and then if I'm really in a hurry, and maybe it's a gray kitten, I might come out and bring the mark further out where I can see it so I don't have to grab the kitten and look in the ear. But I color code them. That, that's Too many that's years nice. of teaching kindergarten. At what age do you nice start um, that letting the kitten sleep through the night? Everybody's gonna have this what was your question? At what age do you let them sleep through the night without getting up to feed them? I really can't go by age. I can just tell by the feeding. First of all, mm -hmm. I, I, my last feeding would be 10 o'clock. My first feeding would be 5 in the morning. So you're basically <laughs> seeing a three-hour feeding. Right. So um, when, when, when I can see that they can go three to four hours, that's going to be two, two and a half weeks in there. Now, once in a while, I am a caregiver for my husband who's very disabled. There's been times when, you know, we've gone to the emergency room and they've gone without care. I do have always a neighbor who has a key, and she's been trained. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, at two and a half weeks, I'm not real concerned. Now, yesterday, I, in the rain, I was taking a group of people on a tour for, I live in a senior center, and I do some of the training over there on a tour of structures in San Antonio and I left the kittens at 9 in the morning and I didn't get back until 2.30 in the afternoon and they were fine. The, you know, you, these kittens are eating wet food, they're eating dry food, they want the bottle but they don't get it. They get a little bowl of milk and they look at you like, are you crazy? I want this. What kind like of mother bottle. are you? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of mother are you? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but. Um, this little kitten up here, we used this picture for a previous slideshow. A beginning foster, you would not give them newborn kittens. You know, I start my fosters with uh, kittens that are weaned, and then grueling kittens, and then maybe a couple of bottle feeders that have been well started that are on the bottle, and I give them the nipple that they use. That's the most important thing to do is after you give them the kitten, give them the nipple that the kittens are comfortable with. And you, you work up, or you could say you work down to the more critical care ones. So you mark the nipple too? Yes, yes. I would the color code the, yeah. the bottom of the bottle and the nipple and the ring. All the and the kitten. <laughs> yeah, and the kitten, yes. Before we started taping, you were talking about how you soften the nipples. I don't want to get that on the video. The nipples we're talking about are the miracle nipples. And the manufacturing company that's producing them has changed. And the nipples are stiffer than they used to be. This is an old one and it's kind of tan. The newer ones are very white. Megan and I boil them. And I don't mean that we have a huge rolling boil, but we put them in the pan and it's a good simmering boil and we boil them for at least 10 minutes. Wow. And then, we take them out and just as soon as they're cool enough, we can put it in our mouth, we chew them. <laughs> we're only doing one nipple at a time. But you have to break that rubber down or it is too hard on the kittens. Now you can get away with the stiffer ones if they are real little and you can use this short nipple. But you think about this when it's really stiff and this one isn't. Does it stay, after you do all that, does it stay soft or does it get no, it stays soft. It does stay soft. And I've tried other things. I have a balloon pump that fits in there that I pump balloons up with. Another thing you don't do when you're 80 is blow balloons. So I pump <laughs> the air into there and it causes the nipple to expand a little bit. But it's really easier to chew it. You just don't go to the door and talk to your neighbors. So <laughs> how do you keep them from chewing the tip off the nipple? You really can't. I have to watch, I'm sorry, that's a weather alert on my phone up here. 
Yeah, we're all beeping. Yeah, we're all beeping. Yeah. I use, um, sometimes oh, if I'm having issues with sorry. them chewing off the nipples, I'll go to the hard plastic <laughs> syringe with the hard tip mm -hmm. um, because they can still get the milk out with that hard tip, but it's harder for them to bite it off and swallow it. Sometimes you get those bottle babies that are stubborn about switching to gruel and they want that bottle, but they chew the nipple off. And, and the that problem is, is at four weeks is they are cutting their back teeth. And it, it makes it feel better if you can chew on something. So I have gotten, so I take a piece of cardboard about a foot long and I fold it to make a triangle and tape it so it stays together in a triangle. And I put it in there and they chew on it. They bite it. It's like a toy for them. And that takes away some of that need to have that texture in their mouth. I wonder if they work with a teething ring like we give regular babies going. Well, that it's that kind of, kind of thing, but you know, I mean, yeah. if you want to become a millionaire, make a, 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 a pacifier ring. for kittens. <laughs> Truly, yeah. we need a pacifier for kittens. And the lady who marketed these, she sent me some that didn't have a hole in it to see if they would work. Didn't work. So this, this didn't work. So on that uh, pet egg bottle and nipple, um, you know, you have to cut a hole in it. Yeah. Yes. So how do you make sure it's that? Uh, sometimes I've had to use that, and I either get the hole too big or too little. Well, if you have the hole too big, hang on to it because. When I transition kittens from bottle to meat, in the last three or four days, I'm putting a can of pate food in with their two cups of formula and running it through the blender, and then I need that enlarged hole. So don't throw it away. But when I'm trying, and I'm trying, where, where's that bottle? It's up here, somewhere under all the mess. Here it is. Um, they say to cross cut it with an X. Uh -huh. I take little tiny scissors that you trim your cuticles with and I get a straight cut first. And then I go in and I do a perpendicular cut. So now I have three and that's when I start testing. If three does it and I just get a drop now, you know, it drops slowly, then I don't make the fourth cut to get a full X. So, but I have ruined nipples, and it, so you go very cautiously. I have tried heating uh, a, a, a darning needle, a big thick needle, and that does work, but it stinks, and the taste of that heated rubber is in the bottle, and the kittens don't like that, so I finally stopped with that. Now, a razor blade will cut. But it's just a matter of finding what implement you have that will work. And How do you get them to suck? Hmm? How do you get them to suck? I've had it when I'm using that, and they are throwing their heads all over, and they are no more going to suck that nipple than the man in the moon. No, it, 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 it's a real problem. Um, when I have a kitten that refuses to suck, not because it's chewing, but it's just not sucking, I'll put it put it back and, and, and go to a different kitten for a while and let them think about it. You know, they're hungry and start again. And you usually can get them to suck the second time or the third time, but yeah. And if they won't, then I do a syringe. Well, I've gone to that because I didn't know what else to do in the panic yeah. mode. So, well, and sometimes when you first get them, either they're confused because they're going from mama's nipple to so one of these and that they don't, or they're so weak that they just can't suckle. And so oftentimes I find if I syringe feed them for 24 hours, after that they're ready and they'll suckle on the bottle. Yeah. And when, especially if your coordinator is coming to you with kittens, she knows something about, they're not just been dropped off at the office, but she knows something about their history. You're asking, you know, what food are they on? How long were they on it? Where's the nipple? And I dilute my formula to, to start with, mm -hmm. always, because I don't know what their food has been like. And if you dilute that formula, you're going to have less trouble. Okay. You can always feed them more often, but just put, 
put extra water in there. Thank you for saying that, because I find, particularly with the powdered KMR and the neonates, it tends to constipate them. Mm -hmm. And so I, I also add a little extra water until they're about two or three weeks old anyway, and then I can start backing off on that extra water and see what their stools look like and if they're able to go okay. Yeah. I don't usually do it that long, but always when, when, when I don't know, you know, Megan, when she brings me kittens, she knows. Here's the formula, here's the bottle, here's the nipple, here's the kitten. <laughs> but uh, if you don't know, then you just have to assume, and, and I will dilute uh, about 20%. And you know, just keep that up even uh, two or three days. Uh, you can go longer than that, but just uh, make sure all the plumbing is working and everything. Any other questions? Well, thank you. First of all, thank you for what you do for the kittens. And, and thank you for being such good listeners and coming out in such a rain. Thank you so much, Mary. And and you, you had, um, oh, this is my foster. Um, this is my feeling about fostering and why I do this. Fostering kittens is a time-consuming, stressful, and labor-intensive vocation. Why do I do it? I do it for myself, for the love, pleasure, and satisfaction it brings me. I love teaching, but I do that for the students. I love my family members and sharing all their special moments. But my bottle babies, I foster for myself. When they stare up at me, the only mother they know with loving eyes, I forget the sleep deprivation, the constant cleaning, the laundry, and the intense sorrow when one doesn't make it. Each little kitten is a bundle of love and trust, a beacon of hope for the future, and a way to pay back the world for all the joys cats have brought me throughout my life. Fostering animals is the hardest job you'll ever love. They come to you at the most inconvenient times. Many are dirty, infested, and sick. Few are really healthy, and all are hungry. Some arrive in boxes, sacks, and cages. Others just wander in, having been dumped in your neighborhood. The one thing they have in common is need for warmth, protection, food, and love. So I gather them in and try to save them. No matter how much I give of myself to their rescue and rehabilitation, they give me back more in return. I make a difference in their lives, even for the ones that don't survive especially for them, because I provide the only comfort and love they knew. Give me the helpless, the lost, the homeless wee ones struggling just to live, the innocent refuse of an uncaring society. Send these, the weak abandoned lives to me. I offer warmth, care, hope, and love, but they are so tiny, and I am just one rescue worker in a city that doesn't seem to care, but I care. And I know it's the right thing to do. And when I see one of my babies adopted and settled in its forever home, I experience enormous satisfaction and joy. So what begins in anxiety and concerns ends in a perfect day. I am energized and strengthened by each foster experience, and I rededicate myself to rescue work. Try it. I say again, fostering animals is the hardest job you'll ever love. These are two little flasters, not related. <laughs> this is Smudgy. Smudgy came to us at 15 days wearing, weighing four ounces, and she was the only survivor. And I call her my wild child now, because we had her for three weeks without any other kittens around, and she is very spoiled. Mm -hmm. Her idea of being in the pen is being on top of it and using it as a trampoline. <laughs> and then King Tut is from a litter of five. He's really sweet. But there, there are Egyptians. So we have Pharaoh and Nefertiti and Ramses, King Tut and Ptolemy. Thank you for all the help you give our little guys like Tut and the wild child. <laughs>